Speaker number 11, Art Pierce. My name is Art Pierce, A-R-T-P-E-A-R-C-E. -E. And I've been a member of the uh, Council of Government's Gastrolink Task Force for the last year plus. And I've worked on a variety of issues, but I wanted to just talk for a second about home rule and uh, community's right to govern what happens within its boundaries. Uh, when the legislature, the New York State Legislature, adopted Article 23 of the Environmental Conservation Law, and this is the, uh, the provision that gives the DEC the power and, and requires them to regulate gas drilling. At the same time, however, when they did that, they did not touch the rights of local governments under the municipal home rule provisions uh, of the state constitution. Municipal home rule is a guaranteed right of local governments, and while the DEC is charged with regulating the gas industry, it has no authority to take away a community's home rule powers. Even in states with a history of open natural gas uh, and resource extraction, home rule still governs. States such as Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, all maintain the authority of their localities to decide whether natural grass drilling will be allowed and where it will be allowed. The DEC doesn't propose uh, to dictate to the drilling companies where they may drill. As it stands now, the DEC is not involved in the location, pace, procedure, intensity of drilling activity. They issue a permit for a drilling unit and then uh, there's several years can pass before something happens and a local government has no control over where that will be as long as it meets the requirements as spelled out in the regulations. Instead, the decision as to where it goes really is left entirely in the discretion of the gas drilling companies. Surely, the legislature never intended that gas drilling companies would be allowed to determine land use across upstate New York. Absent local authority over land use, that would be the consequence, since the DEC is not governing the location of drilling activities. Now, as you know, there's a lawsuit in Dryden, and we don't know how that's going to play out. I think it'll work out favorably for uh, the, the town of Dryden. But there's another way of dealing with this whole issue, and that's under Seeker. This whole S-Geis is, is required under that process of environmental review. And under that, the DEC should include in its regulations a provision that no permits shall be issued where an adver adverse impact to community character is determined under seeker. And all they would have to do is look at communities that had passed zoning ordinances or other requirements to restrict gas drilling. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is number 12, Chris Kale. Hi. My name's Chris Kale, that's spelled K-R-Y-S, last name C-A-I-L. I'm here this evening representing the NOFA New York, Northeast Organic Farming Association of New York. And in specific, we, we've, there are several actually members in the audience and we have a gas drilling committee I'm, I'm the chair of that gas drilling committee. We actually have some of the other members of that committee here in the audience tonight as well. We've spent a couple of years studying things pretty clearly. We passed policy as an organization, our board officially, um, last January that we again reviewed when the S guys came out this year. We are not recommending that any of the policy that we passed last time around be changed because unfortunately, all of the issues we brought up after the last S. Geis remain problems. I'm going to focus specifically in this short time on the socioeconomic impact study that uh, was done by the consultants in E&E &E, Ecology and Environment. In that study, they begin, as, as Robert Howarth so, so clearly pointed out, they begin with an erroneous estimate of the total amount of gas available uh, to be extracted in New York State. It's wrong by at least five-fold, and frankly, we have concerns that it's, it's wrong by more than that. 
Therefore, all of their estimates regarding proposed income uh, and job growth and taxes to, to municipalities are, um, you know, essentially multiplied out from that. Uh, while they mention, as, as my neighbor Ken uh, just pointed out, that there may be uh, some negative effects to agriculture as an industry, they do not, in fact, do any subtraction. Now, we have a lot of things we want considered, but if you just look strictly at farmland preservation, which is a goal of New York State that we actually spend taxpayer money to, to pursue. If a five acre drill pad is taken up with drilling, that five acres can't be used by an organic farmer to produce organic food. It simply isn't true that there is no trade-off between agricultural industry and particularly organic agriculture and gas drilling. There is. I'd like to give the rest of my time to the audience. Do you want food or do you want gas? Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Jan Quarles, number 13. And uh, Jan, if you could hang out afterwards, I need to get your signature on this, saying that you release our, our, the transcription. So just hang around for a few minutes. Thanks. Sure. <clears throat> My name is spelled J-A-N. Last name is Q-U-A-R-L-E-S. And my husband and I have owned a productive 63-acre organic grain farm in Ovid, New York, 20 miles north of here, for over 25 years. Our farm is on the Cayuga Wine Trail. For eight years, I was the private events manager for Sheldrake Point Winery next door to our farm, where I oversaw hundreds of private events and weddings with visitors from many parts of the nation who came to enjoy the beautiful food shed, water shed, and view shed that's so precious to all of us in this region. The first flaw <coughs> excuse me, I'll address in the Eskice is the socioeconomic impact analysis. This analysis says that the average gas development scenario will bring 53,969 jobs to our state. But only in the fine print of a little footnote at the bottom, they mention it's a 30-year projection. Divide their figure by 30, you get 1,800 jobs per year. But wait, in reality, a truer projection is less than one-tenth of that, fewer than 200 jobs per year across the state. This was revealed in Food and Water Watch's recent study that they published two days ago. They point out that the DEC's projection counts jobs that will be filled by out-of-state experts, overestimates production of wells to last 30 years when the average well production lasts more like three years, and they fail to admit that they'll subtract existing jobs that are offered by tourism, agriculture, and recreation. In the Finger Lakes alone, that means over 56,000 jobs. These will be seriously reduced if the landscape is transformed into an industrial drilling zone with heavy traffic snarling the roads. It has taken us almost two decades to build up this beautiful, green, regional, sustainable economy with over 110 wineries, breweries, and distilleries that are visited by millions from all over the world with restaurants that source from thousands of local farms. Why should we trade this green, healthy economy for one that pollutes, that has a negative impact on our health and on our jobs? I want to say in closing that the neighbors in the Broome, Tioga, and Chemung counties are part of our community. So in the section, the Eskice on community character, I want the DC to know that we'll continue to fight with them. They're going door to door to ban fracking by the town by town in their um, areas, Big Flats, Horseheads, Vestal, and so forth. They are our neighbors, they are our sisters and brothers, and we will fight by their side to ban fracking across New York State. Thank you. Thank you. And Jan, if you could stay up. Great. Uh, thank you. Our next speaker is number 14, Nancy Metzger. Hi, my name is Nancy Metzger, that's M-E-D-S-K-E-R, and my comments will be in response to what is missing from the SKIS, and that is a counter-response to the main, three main talking points that I keep hearing from the drill baby drill crowd. 
But first, I must say that the people against drilling are not being over-emotional or overreacting. We are just concerned New York citizens that are from all walks of life, different ages and backgrounds. It is not just the environmentalists that are taking a stand against drilling, but many people that are united by fear. Folks in favor of drilling keep talking about jobs, money, and their land rights. Gas drilling will bring in jobs, but the majority of them will not be given to New York State residents, and many of them will be only for the short term. There are lots of jobs in alternative energy, especially the solar industry. I know this because my twin sons and six other kids from Ithaca are currently working construction and, and installing big seven-acre solar farms in New Jersey, Tennessee, Kentucky, North Carolina, South Carolina, Vermont, Pennsylvania, and California. I didn't say New York. They are not making, the, and they are making good money, and they're not working in New York because we don't have the incentives for large solar installs. What we need here is a solar jobs bill passed immediately to encourage renewable energy growth in New York State. <laughs> I also keep hearing about the money drilling is going to bring in. We'll tell that to the many of the people in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, where they've been putting up with all the disadvantages of gas drilling, but they don't have any money yet. This is because over 14 gas wells have been drilled, but only 50 of them have been fracked. With the glut of natural gas on the market and the low prices, it could be years before they see any money at all. And by the way, why is Harrisburg, Pennsylvania filing for bankruptcy if there is so much money to be made? <laughs> then there is a mantra, it is my land and I can do what I want with it. Once drilling starts, these landowners will lose all control of their land as the gas companies will come in, take it over, put up the rigs, roads, and wreckage wherever they want. Ask the farmers in West Virginia about this. They're losing their best fields, meadows, and woodlands to drilling and truly losing their way of life. Plus, no one will want this land after it's drilled, especially the mortgage banks and the insurance companies. These pro frackers will be stuck with their worthless land and we will all be suffering the horrible side effects of gas drilling. So I say they can do what they want with their land, but not that if it affects anyone else. I think I'm going to run out of time, so I can't finish. So contact your representatives about promoting well, uh, renewable energy in New York State, please. Thank you. And Nancy, actually, if I could get your signature for our next speaker, the speaker who's Elijah, uh, number 15. And, and also, I see there are many people in the back. We have many seats up front. If you'd like to come down to the front, we have many open seats. Hi, my name is Elijah DeCastro. I want to read the letter that I sent to Governor Cuomo about fracking. Dear Co Governor Cuomo, I'm an ordinary fifth grader in Trumansburg, New York. My mother says that if they do horizontal hydraulic fracturing anywhere in New York, we'll have to move to a totally different state. I have lived in New York all my life. I've grown comfortable in New York, and it would be a nightmare to moving to a totally different state. I would really miss my friends in my school. Please read this list, this true list, two times. They say it's safe, but they one. They say it's safe, but they've done many bad things in Pennsylvania. Two. Their trucks make the road impossible for kids to ride bikes. Three. They give kids asthma or even kill them. They make the place. Four. They make the place smoggy. I have sensitive lungs. They are very, very powerful. Please don't kill me. Very truly yours, Elijah DeCastro. And now I want to read the letter that I got back from Governor Cuomo. Dear Elijah, thank you for your letter. I am encouraged to know that young people are taking an active interest in the government. And it is an exciting time to be governor. As you may know, our state is facing great challenges, but we have a great opportunity to bring the, all New Yorkers together to work towards a better future. I have three daughters, and I strive every day to ensure that they will leave that that we will leave them and you and, and you uh, New York filled with opportunity, safety, and prosperity. I have had. I have had passion for public service since I was very young, and I encourage that you pursue your passions. All dreams are reachable with hard, hard work and dedication. 
Sincerely, Andrew Cuomo. I would like the governor to know that my passion is to ban fracking. I have learned, I have learned a ton of information about government through this letter. Kids need a healthy environment to live in. Kids don't want to worry about their backyard where they play sports is going to blow up. I also want the governor to know that I don't I want a job in the gas industry. My favorite animal is polar bears, and solar panels will help them live. Thank you. Thank you to our next state senator. Um, our next speaker is number 16, Robert Oswald, and I'd like to invite at this time speakers number 17 through 24 to please uh, line up. That will be an extremely hard act to follow. <laughs> uh, my name's Robert Oswald, R-O-B-E-R-T-O-S-W-A-L-D. -E I'm a faculty member at the Cornell College of Veter Veterinary Medicine, and I've been involved in the uh, Ulysses um, gas drilling ban. Uh, uh, for the last two years, Michelle Bamberg and I have been studying uh, and documenting the uh, veterinary effects of gas drilling in states that allow horizontal hydrofracking. Uh, primarily, this is Pennsylvania, but it's, a, it's actually five different states. Uh, and I could tell you a lot about some of the horrific stories that we have about the harm to people and animals due to this process. But really what's most striking about our data is really the lack of data. That is, it's very difficult now to prove the connections between gas drilling and health impacts. The problem is we don't know what the chemicals that are used in drilling specific wells are. And there's not adequate testing of air, soil, water, animals, or humans. When testing is done, it's necessarily incomplete, mainly because of the ignorance. We don't know what chemicals to test for because we don't know what's been used. Uh, and sometimes it's just willful ignorance of the, on the part of people testing. When I read the Eskice in full, I read all of it, I was struck by the fact that we will not be protected any more here than they are in any other state. Um, when one designs a document such as this, the goal should be to hope for the best and plan for the worst. However, this document hopes for the best and plans for the best. Public health is only minimally considered, and there's a reason for that. The reason for that is that no accidents will happen because the regulations are so good. They've been reading too much Voltaire. Uh, okay, so we know that accidents do happen, so what do they do? What are they going to do? Well, oh, one minute. <laughs> Free drilling tests are mandated, um, but the only organic to be tested is BTEX. Um, this is really remarkable because they said BTEX will not be in the wells. It's probably wrong, but that's what they said. They also said that we don't know about the toxicity of many of the drilling fluids, and there are no EPA-mandated levels. So what do they do about this? They make up EPA-mandated, or they make up maximum contaminant levels, just out of whole cloth. So, so basically what they're doing is they're testing uh, for organics that are not there, and making up the toxicity of things that are there. So what do we need to do about all of this? We need to have full disclosure of all chemicals that are used in the fracking process. <clears throat> there are lists of these chemicals, but that's not good enough. It's just an industry ruse. What we need to know about is the chemicals that are in each well so they could be tested for properly. I have to stop, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is number 17, Judy Abrams. Judy, J-U-D-Y, Abrams, A-B-R-A-M-S. This August, an invasion was discovered in the Cayuga Inlet that was so terrifying that a state of emergency was declared in the city of Ithaca. Within eight weeks, the invasion was attacked at a cost of nearly $100,000 in municipal, county, and state funds. The name of the invader that caused such fear and such a massive effort is Hydrilla verticillata. It is a water weed 
that is known as the perfect aquatic weed for its ability to aggressively spread through waterways. Hydrilla can grow an inch a day and reach lengths up to 30 feet. We were told if it had been allowed to continue growing for two more years, we would all be walking across the inlet. When the plant becomes established, it displaces native aquatic plants and ruins swimming, fishing, and boating. It clogs intake and outflow pipes, it harms tourism, and ruins the value of waterfront property. In Florida, hydrilla was allowed to become established. The yearly cost to just to control the weed enough to navigate waterways is now $30 million a year. The thought of this weed spreading throughout the Finger Lakes and the Great Lakes is terrifying. It has been estimated that hydrilla had been in the Cuga Lake Inlet for two years. How did it go unnoticed in a body of water with so much use and in a city with so many trained biologists? It's because hydrilla looks just like every other water weed to untrained observers. Hydrilla is so invasive that a single inch of stem that reaches a body of water can root and establish a new population. Has hydrilla colonized other waterways in upstate New York? We don't know. A survey hasn't been undertaken. The Invasive Species Management Coordinator of the DEC told me there is no funding stream to pay for such a survey. Water for fracking the Marcellus Shale can come from any public body of water. Water is suctioned into thousands of trucks each time a well is fracked. The trucks travel through the region, moving from one body of water to another. This is the perfect way to spread hydrilla. There, there are provisions in the S guys to stop the spread of the invasive species. However, these provisions were written before hydrilla was discovered in the area. Section 7422 suggests that trucks will be inspected and cleaned after drawing water before transporting water to another site. If hydrofracking is allowed, we will be counting on the gas companies themselves to identify a weed that looks almost identical to other weeds and to clean every single truck that will be crisscrossing our state so that not even a single inch of hydrilla will be transported to new bodies of water. If hydrilla does spread to new areas, there will be no way to prove whether gas companies had anything to do with the invasions, and New York will be left to control this weed, which will cost the state hundreds of millions of dollars. The yes guys must be changed to include a survey of any possible hydrilla infestations and to account for the more stringent controls needed. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is number 18, Bill Padoka. Hello. Um, I have a few comments about the DC and the revised SGIS, and my name is Bill Padulka uh, with a B, and the last name is P-O-D-U-L-K-A. And I'd apologize to the representative from the DEC if some of my comments are, are harsh, uh, but I must tell you that I am disappointed, frustrated, angry, and simply plain let down uh, by the agency. And I will explain some of that by talking about my family's interactions a bit with the DEC and also some of my reading of the draft. Uh, and, and these experiences have led me to question whether the DEC not only can, but whether it is willing to seriously address the issues involved with high volume hydraulic fracturing. So first let me tell you my wife's story. Um, when the revised, preliminary revised draft came out in July, she was reading it and noticed that the size given for the well pad of a multi-well pad was three point some odd acres. And this was different than what had been in the first draft in, in the 2009 and also different than what the Nature Conservancy and other groups had actually measured as actually happening in Pennsylvania. So she checked the reference and saw that the reference for that number was an email from someone in Pennsylvania to a DEC official. And she decided she wanted to check on that, so she called the DEC to ask about it. And over the next two months, she called at least six different times to three different phone numbers to many different officials, all of whom swore they would get back to her and tell, find someone to answer her question as to what that was really based on. And they never did. Finally, there was one DC official, uh, Carl Besser, who did call and promised absolutely to answer if she would just read, give a detailed written question of what she wanted to know, which she finally did in an email but he never responded to the email, never acknowledged he even got the email, much less answered it. We asked Barbara Lipton's office if they could intercede, and they did, and uh, talked to the legislative liaison for the DEC, but their emails were also ignored. And to this date, we have not gotten any response from the DEC, nor even acknowledgement that we have asked them a question. And so my question is, if they can't even answer a simple question like this, if they feel they don't have the staff to respond to people's inquiries, how in heck are they going to handle taking care of all those wells and reviewing the regulations? 
Okay, so two other things. In the, you've already heard some of the inaccuracies in the draft SGIS. My point is that the misrepresentations and plain disregard of various studies and data contrary to the agenda of approving hydraulic fracturing amounts to scientific fraud. Bob Howarth talked about the fact that they'd ignored his research and any other research that talks about methane emissions. The Duke study, which talked about methane migration to wells, the DEC decided to ignore 90% of the results and look at just the nine wells in New York and say, there's one active well in New York, it doesn't have a methane problem, what's the big deal? They're ignoring all the statistically relevant data. And the economic impacts, they rely on, on one report by Considine and they ignore work by Susan Christopherson at Cornell, uh, William Freudenberg, uh, Arthur Berman, all these people who have bring up other data, they've completely ignored. So all I can say is, there are people who feel the DEC has spent long enough studying this. It's not how much time they spend, but it's the quality of the product. This is not good enough and needs to be redone. Thank you. Our next speaker, number 19, Gregory May. Gregory, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y, May, M-A-Y. My name is Greg May. I'm a vice president of mortgage lending at Tompkins Trust Company. My comments today are not designed to express opinions. My comments today are designed to bring about understanding of highly serious conflicts that exist with longstanding mortgage reg regulations. Traditional residential mortgage lending in New York State is in jeopardy if the state's current regulations are not changed to account for the longstanding secondary market requirements as they relate to setback distances. If traditional residential mortgage lending is not available, the market for buying and selling residential homes will be severely negatively impacted. Specific areas of conflict are as follows. Number one, Freddie Mac regulations state surface or subsurface entry within 200 feet of a residential structure would not be acceptable for financing. Fannie Mae and Sunny Mae have similar requirements. FHA requirements state no existing dwelling may be located closer than 300 feet from an active or planned drilling site. Note that this applies to the site boundaries and not just to the actual well site. VA has adopted similar requirements. Number three, if a gas lease exists on a residential property, title insurance, which is commonly required, is ineffective to protect the lender against common activities undertaken pursuant to a gas lease. Number four, the commonly accepted mortgage document utilized in New York is the standard Fannie Freddie document last revised in 2001. Section 18 of that document prohibits transfer or sale of any portion of or rights to a mortgage property without prior written consent of the lender. Section 21 of that document prohibits environmental hazardous substances, specifically naming gas, from being stored, used, disposed, discharged, or released on the mortgage property and the borrower also in that area agrees not to allow any other entity to do any of those prohibited activities. Should an owner execute a lease without prior written lender permission or allow any of those activities, it actually is a default under the terms of the mortgage document. I strongly urge New York State to take decisive action to preserve the rights of the state's residents and taxpayers to own and finance a home. My specific request is to address the issues as follows. Revise the DEC regulations under Environmental Conservation Law Title 23 DEC Regulation Part 553.2 and complete Section 7.12.1 of the SGIS to establish a minimum setback distance of not less than 300 feet measured on the surface but extending subsurface to preserve the fee simple ownership of all subsurface rights. For all drilling and any ancillary activities, from the boundary lines of all properties contained, containing a residential structure, a school, or a public building. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker number 20, Peter Handeberg. Uh, Peter Huderberg, last is H-U-D-I-B-U-R-G. How much money has the state spent on researching, developing, and reviewing the various versions of this SGIS? How much money will the DEC spend to permit and inspect possibly 80,000 Marcellus wells and an untold number of Utica wells? How much money will the DEC need to plug the thousands of abandoned wells and the tens of thousands of depleted Marcellus and Utica wells when the dr drilling companies go bankrupt 
and there is not sufficient bonding to cover those costs. What about the 50% of those plugs leaking that will start leaking after 15 years? Are those not serious and expensive forms of subsidy and a special dispensation for the oil and gas industry? How much extra profit does the state allow the industry with its compulsory integration? How much money will the state lose by not charging a severance tax and by not updating the hopelessly cumbersome ad valorem tax? Why has the state legislature and the governor not removed these de facto subsidies? We need to instead subsidize renewable energy. Such a change in policy would go a long way toward revitalizing New York State economy. Why, why is Professor Haworth's study not cited in this esguise? As most of us know, the world is getting hotter, with 2011 one of the warmest years on record, and humans are to blame. That's according to the World Meteorological Organization. $14 billion in U.S. weather-related disasters in this, in this year. Tornadoes, hurricanes, floods have killed more than 600 people just this year. Meanwhile, net-zero houses can save 90% of energy usage and in some cases produce more energy than they consume. Therefore, zero CO2 is produced by those houses. Nyserder has renovated four houses um, with deep energy retrofits using super insulation in Utica. They insulate, the first thing they do is to throw out the furnace and the boiler. Uh, they, they, uh, they'll not be needed in the future. They super insulate the basement floor, the basement walls, the outside walls, the, they super insulate the attic. The end result are houses that can be heated with only an auxiliary coil off the hot water heater. So, so you have a 75% reduction in heating costs. Um, so, um, meanwhile, Germany produces 20% of their electric from those sources and plans to produce 80% by 2050. They plan to reduce their CO2 emissions by 40% by 2020 and 80% by 2050. Why can't uh, New York State do the same thing, right? Thank you. And I see people standing in the back. There are seats available uh, up front. Thank you.